Welcome to Choice Classic Radio, where we bring to you the greatest old-time radio shows. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and thank you for donating at choiceclassicradio.com. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. of death. This is the story of a man named Spear, of a bird, a kind of carrion crow, and of a student of birds named Victor. This is also a story of Victor's uncle, Orin, but that comes later. At this moment, we are concerned only with the trio, Spear, Victor, and the bird of death, the crow. Watch this, Victor. I'm going to get him. I wouldn't if I were you, Spear. Got him. No, no, you just wounded him. He's getting away. Where did you object to my shooting that bird? It's a member of the Corvus Caroni family, a kind of carrion crow. So what? Well, there's an old Indian tradition about those particular birds. A tradition, eh? Well, what is it? Not that I'm interested in those old superstitions. I would be if I were you, Spear. Why? Because according to legend, it is the bird of death. This is also the story of Victor's uncle, Oren. A man with a different kind of interest in birds. An interest that often took him and Spear to a certain marsh. Are those all the decoys we brought with the Spear? Yes, sir. Then roll over to the blind. Uh, never can tell when a flight of ducks will come along. Yes, sir. There's that, uh, that old fishing weir. It's a pity it isn't used anymore. I hate to see anything wasted. Yes, sir. Just a lot of stakes driven into the marsh. A fish trap. They bait it, the fish get in, and they're caught. Hmm, looks like an arrow from above. Yes, sir. I'm glad uh, we put the decoys around it. It's a natural place for them. Makes the setting perfect. No duck will be suspicious of it, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you stop that infernal yes, sir. Can't you say anything besides yes, sir? Yes. Uh, of course, Mr. Arne, anything you wish. You know, you're too agreeable today, Spear. Too agreeable. There's a streak of cussedness in you. It's usually right beneath the surface, but you're covering it up today. You're covering it up real well. What's up? Why, nothing. Nothing at all, Mr. Arne. I, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't, eh? Well, most people don't know what the other fellow's talking about. That's what's wrong with the world. All people would. Then, oh, hurry up, Spear. You're rowing as if we had all day. Yes, sir. Can't get over what a perfect setting that old fishing weir makes for our decoys. Why, the ducks have come right into the nozzles of our shotguns without suspecting there are any hunters around. It's a good setup, all right. Good. It's perfect. You know, that's what counts in the world, Spear. The setting. Give a man the right setting and he can get away with murder. Why, there's been many, uh, uh... Hey, Spear, you're not rowing toward the blind. No, I'm not, Mr. Orin. You're rowing toward the fishing weir. What's the big idea? It's the right setting, Mr. Orin. Give a man the right setting and he can get away with murder. You said so yourself. Murder? Murder? What are you talking about? Who's murder? Yours, Mr. Orin. Uh, you stopped rowing. Now, Spear, I don't like this. That's understandable. Most of us are cowards. We flinch from death. Even wealthy men like you, Mr. Orange. Oh, stop joking. Does this shotgun look as if I'm joking? You'll notice it's pointed right at your chest, and the shotgun at close range is a pretty messy weapon, I've read. Why, you... You, you needn't bother looking for your shotgun. It's behind me. You haven't a chance in the world of getting it. In fact, you haven't a chance, period. Spear, you're crazy. 
You can't get away with this. I, I'll call for help. In the first place, you won't call. The instant you even try to yell, I'll pull the trigger. In the second place, who'd hear you out here in the marsh? Why, I don't... Uh, Victor. Yes, that's it. Victor might hear me. He often comes out here to study bird life. Or maybe one of the servants may be around here. None of the servants will be around here today. You know Jed's too lazy to do anything he doesn't have to, and Kathy's rheumatism will keep her indoors on a day like this. But Victor... He, he won't be here today either. No, Mr. Oren, you'd better not count on help from your dear nephew. I've taken care of him. You... You killed Victor? Now, why would I do that? I only want to kill one man, and that's you, Mr. Oren. No, I saw to it that Victor received a new book on ornithology this morning. He's in his study reading about the habits of birds. The habits of birds. Birds that, according to scientists, were once reptiles. But according to science, man was also once a reptile. So the lives of the two, birds and men, may at times be interwoven. In his study, Victor muses. Birds are strange creatures. Jed, do you know that the Ardea Herodias... The what? Uh, the Ardea Herodias, uh, the great blue heron. You mean like them that live around the marsh? Precisely. Well, the Ardea Herodias has one claw that's toothed. You don't say. I don't, but this book does. It says the middle toe is toothed. What's the bird want teeth in his middle toe for? Mm, mm, I suppose to make it easier to hold on to the fish it catches. You've seen them catch fish, haven't you? Yeah, especially around the old fish trap in the marsh. I don't reckon I ever saw one of them lose a fish once he grabbed a hold of it. Precisely. Oh, say, I reckon there ain't much them book writers don't know. Wonder how they learn it. By observation, Jed. Oh, I tell you, this is a fine book. I just got it this morning. I don't know who sent it, but whoever did certainly knew what he was doing. It's a remarkable book. Uh, you ought to read it. Yeah, I ain't no hand at book reading. To think that a man, a man like you or me, could learn so much about ornithology. About what, Mr. Victor? Uh, ornithology, uh, that's the scientific name for the study of bird life. Oh. And he learned it the right way, by watching birds in their native habitats. Yeah? The what? Where they live. What do you want to do that for? Because it's so interesting. Uh, it's fascinating. I think I'll go down to the marsh to watch the idea Herodias myself. Yes, that's what I'll do this very instant. I'm going to the marsh. Oren went to the marsh to kill birds. Spear went to kill Oren. Victor is going to the marsh to observe birds. Birds and men, they're all interwoven. As interwoven as the threads of life and of death. But why, why do you want to kill me, Spear? You've been my secretary almost ten years. I've paid you well, haven't I? I've been good to you, haven't I? But not as good as I'm going to be to myself. Why, why I even made a provision in my will for you. But not as big as the provision I've made in it. Uh, as you've made? What are you talking about? I've destroyed your will and substituted one to fit my own ambitions. I'm going to inherit quite a piece of your estate. So you won't get away with it? You'll be found out. Do you think so? How many years have I been signing your name to letters? About eight. Has anyone ever detected that it isn't your signature? I know that is... Exactly. No one will ever suspect the will is a forgery. Simple, isn't it? But it is never simple, Spear. You're quite philosophic for a man who is about to die. But you overlook the fact that I've planned this carefully for five years. I know every detail of what I'm going to do. There isn't a chance of a slip-up. The perfect crime, eh? Yes, I suppose you can call it that. Everything will go just as I planned it, Mr. Oren. With your money, I'll be on Easy Street the rest of my life. I'm not dead, Jet. I'll take care of that in a moment, sir. There are... Uh... Easier ways of making money, Spear. I like this way better. Incidentally, that's where you're going to be buried, Mr. Oren. Over there at the fishing weir. Take a good look at it. Not every man gets a chance to see his future grave. No, not every man gets a chance to see his future grave. But every man has his own hopes of averting, or at least delaying, death. Other people may inadvertently help him. For instance, right now at Oren's house, Kathy, the housekeeper, is saying... Jed, where's Mr. Victor? In his study, I reckon. You reckon, you reckon. I've oh, never seen such a man for not knowing nothing. Well, ain't he in his study? No, he ain't. Would I be asking if he was there? No, I don't reckon you would. Oh, there you go, reckoning again. Can't you give a body a straight answer? What do you always want to be picking on me for, Kathy? I reckon, I mean, I ain't no nursemaid to know where everybody's at all the time. Now, Jed, you keep a civil tongue in your head. Man, a goshen. You think a body said something outlandish to you. All I asked... All you asked was if I knowed where Mr. Victor is. And I said, say, I just remembered. 
He said he was going out to the marsh to see... Just that... what I thought. Just what I thought. He's going out to see if he can get a look at some of them wild birds he's so crazy about. Oh, I might have known that that man will be the death of me yet. Well, what are you carrying on like that for? Can a man go for a walk to the marsh without you raising a ruckus? Not without his Mackinac on a raw day like this, he can't. Oh, that poor boy will catch his death of cold. <laughs> Goshen, I don't know what folks would do if I didn't look after him. Now, you get Mr. Victor's Mackinac and take it to him right this minute. Oh, Kathy, if he didn't take it himself, maybe it's because he don't want it. Jed, you do like I say. You take Mr. Victor's Mackinac to him right this minute. <sighs> he had my rheumatism. He'd know better than leaving it behind. But how am I going to know where he's at? You just said yourself he was going to the marsh. Well, you go there, too. Keep looking till you find him. Oh, all right, all right. Don't get head up about it. I reckon all I do around here is go traipsing around foreign. Have you had a good look at your future grave, Mr. Oren? You're going to be in it soon. I'm going to kill you with your own shotgun. It'll be the culmination of five years of careful planning. Oh, you ungrateful wretch. I ought to... You ought to keep quiet and listen to me. And don't make any suspicious moves. I've got an itchy trigger finger, and I don't want anything to happen to you until I'm absolutely ready. Spear, I'm telling you again. You're I... telling me again that I can't get away with it. Well, you're wrong, Mr. Owen. You're not dealing with stocks and bonds now. You're dealing with human life. Your life. All right, Spear. You win. I'll make a deal with you. What kind of a deal? I'll pay you as much money as you want. If only you won't kill me. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll make you rich. I'll... You'll I'll... double cross me. That's what you'll do. No, honestly. Honestly, that's a laugh. What an awful sap you must think I am. Why, well, you turn me over to the police so fast it would make my head swim. But it's your head that's going to swim underwater. No, no, Spear, please. I'm going to shoot you, then I'm going to tie you to the bottom of one of the stakes of the fishing weir. You'll be fastened so securely, you'll be there forever. No one will ever find you there. Spear, listen to me. I'll do anything you say, anything, only don't kill me. You're stalling for time, Mr. Aaron, but it won't do you any good. Listen to me, please. You know nothing you say will keep me from carrying out my plans. Listen, I'll sign my property over to you. I'll make it legal. You'll be rich. Now think it over. I have thought it over. For five years. That's a long time, Miss Arne. Everything is just as I planned it, including your begging for mercy. I, I promise. I promise I'll never tell anybody about this. If only... Of course you'll never tell anybody about this. You know the old saying, dead men tell no tales. Spear, I don't want to die. No one wants to die. And no one wants to lie at the bottom of a marsh tied to a fish trap. It isn't much of a monument, especially for a rich man like you, Mr. Arne. But it's going to be yours. For eternity. Please, please. Your proposition, if I let you live. I'll do anything you want, Spear. Anything you want. I'll give you everything I've got. Now, you'll never regret it. Believe me, you won't. You're right. I'll never regret it. And by it, I mean this. This is the story of Spear and the gun which he fired twice. The first time at a crow, which he did not kill, but merely crippled. The second time at his employer, Mr. Oren, whom he murdered on the spot. This is the story of Victor, Mr. Oren's nephew, a student of bird life who worries about the crippled crow and who questions Spear about the disappearance of his uncle. He does not know that Spear has fastened Mr. Oren's dead body to the bottom of an old fishing weir in the marsh. <laughs> You were right, Victor. That crow was the bird of death. Of course, I don't believe in Indian superstitions, but if I hadn't shot that bird, maybe Mr. Oren wouldn't be dead now. Don't blame yourself, Spear. But what I can't understand is why we haven't been able to recover the body. That crew of men has been searching around the center of the marsh with grappling hooks all day now. And maybe the body is caught on a shrub or something at the bottom. This could be. If that's the case, I'll ask them to use dynamite. Dynamite? I hadn't thought of that. Are you sure you pointed out the exact spot where the, exa the accident happened? I'm positive. Then there's nothing to do but use dynamite. That'll dislodge anything in the immediate vicinity. Been using dynamite and still no sign of Uncle's body. I'm just as sorry about that as you are, but as I said before, it's probably wedged between some shrubs or rocks down at the bottom. These old marshes are full of them, you know. Yes. I know how you must feel, Victor, but please bear in mind it, it isn't easy for me either. I can understand that. You're having been with him when it happened. I'll never forget it. It was terrible. Last night I dreamed about it. I felt the water closing over me as I surfaced, dived the last time trying to find him. My hands searched in vain. I could feel the water suffocating me, and then I awoke drenched in cold sweat. Oh, if only I could have saved him. Don't blame yourself, Spear. You did everything you could. 
too bad Jed and I didn't get here about five minutes sooner. Then we could have helped. Yes, it's too bad. I can't get over an experienced hunter like Uncle capsizing the boat. Well, as I told you before, he was so anxious to get the duck he'd shot, he leaned way over the gunwale as he reached for it. He leaned too far. The boat turned over, plunging us both into the water. Yes, you told us about that. I tried to get him to stay in the blind while I rowed out and retrieved the bird, but no, nothing would do but for him to get into the boat with me. I asked him not to. Why? Why what? Why did you ask him not to get into the boat with you? Oh, well, I, uh, I don't really know, only... Only you had a premonition. Is that it, Spear? Well, no, that is not exactly... A... Only there was no necessity for both of us going after the duck. I could have gotten it myself. I always have in the past when we went hunting together. But this time, things worked out differently, eh, Spear? Yes, this time things worked out differently. Maybe things like that are planned. What do you mean? Oh, fate, destiny, you know, that sort of thing. I believe everything happens according to plan. Everything. Who will gainsay that everything does happen according to plan? But whose plan? And what is the plan? Is there no such thing as circumstance? And what part does it play in the plans a man may make? And they haven't found the body yet? Nary a sign of it, Kathy. Nary a sign. Oh, poor Mr. Oren, not getting a decent burial. It ain't right, him being down the bottom of the marsh like that. I tell you, Jed, it ain't right. No, reckon ain't nobody going to argue with you about that. But day's dynamiting ain't done no good. Ain't much more that can be done. You mean they'll leave him down there? I reckon so. What else can they do? Well, I don't rightly know, but seems like they oughtn't to give up till they find poor Mr. Oren's body. Maybe they ain't never going to find it. Why? Maybe it just wasn't meant to be found. Oh, Jed, you don't make no sense. No. Lots of things don't make no sense, if you ask me. Things like what? Well, I don't rightly know how to put it, but some things just don't add up. Oh, land of Goshen, Jed, you're going to drive me plumb crazy with that kind of talk. What things don't add up? Well, it's like this, Kathy. You recollect you sent me out to the marsh to find Mr. Victor and give him his Mackinac? Of course I recollect. Well, I done like you told me to. I found him moseying along toward the marsh, reading one of them books that he got the very day of Mr. Orange's accident. I know all about that. Yeah, but here's what you don't know. He asked me to go to the marsh with him. He wanted to show me something about a... a dear... Her, 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 about Blue Heron. And so I went with him. I know all about that, too. What of it? Hold your horses, will you? I'm coming to that. We heard a shot from the marsh, along about the fishing where, I'd say. And a few minutes later, when we got there... There was Mr. Spear dripping water and climbing out of the marsh with his story about how Mr. Orrin was drowned. Well, what don't add up for that? It's exactly what Mr. Spear's been telling about the accident. Yeah, but according to his story, Mr. Orrin, he shot a duck from where they was hiding in the blind. The duck fell in the middle of the marsh, and he and Mr. Spear, they got in the boat and rowed out to get the dead bird. That's right. Mr. Orrin leans out to pick the duck out of the water, and the boat turns over, drowning him. Even though Mr. Spear, according to his story done everything he could to save Mr. Orrin. Now, it appears to me that was a mighty short time for all that to happen. Seems like all them doings ought to take more than, a, well, more than the four or five minutes it took me and Mr. Victor to get to the marsh and see Mr. Spear climbing out of it. Oh, land of Goshen, Jed, that kind of talk would drive a body clean out of their mind. Maybe it took you and Mr. Victor more than four or five minutes to get to the edge of the marsh. No, it didn't. And even if it didn't, that don't mean nothing. Things just naturally happen fast sometimes. Yeah, maybe. But still, it just don't set right with me. I reckon it ought to take more time than that for all them things to happen. <laughs> so they stopped dynamite, no? Yeah, Kathy, Mr. Victor finally give it up. Said there was no use keeping it up forever. Oh, that means poor Mr. Orrin will be down there at the bottom of the marsh till doomsday. I reckon so. I still say the whole thing don't add up just right. Oh, now don't start that again, Jed. I say, buddy just can't stand being around you when you carry on with such crazy talk. I just can't help feeling... Oh, that... land of Goshen. Oh, you make even my rheumatism worse for that kind of talk. All right, then I'll keep quiet about it. But I still say... There you go again. All right, all right. Don't get yourself head up. You and your crazy talk. You haven't told Mr. Victor any of it, have you? No. Well, don't. He's got enough on his mind right now as is. I won't say nary word about it to him. Promise? Yes, I promise. Oh, that's better. By the way, where is Mr. Victor now? I reckon he and Mr. Spears over at the lawyer's for the reading of the will. Hmm. 
Looks like they could have waited a spell before they went into that. Miss Spear said they might as well get over with. Uh, guess he's right. Oh, I get all fussed up inside thinking of poor Mr. Oren resting down the butter. Jed, where you going? I think I'll just mosey on over to the marsh for a spell. I just can't get it through my head why the whole thing don't matter. Oh, believe me, Victor, the contents of the will are as much of a surprise to me as they must be to you. I thought Mr. Oren would remember me, but I didn't dream he would leave me the bulk of his estate. Neither did I. I'm sorry if it upset your plans in any way. My plans? Looks as though Uncle didn't think much of them. Then he knew about them? He knew I wanted to devote my life to ornithology. He gave me the impression he approved of it. He must have changed his mind. Evidently. But it doesn't change mine. I'm going to be an ornithologist. I played around with it before as a hobby, but I'm in dead earnest now. I'm going to start right away. In fact, right now. Now? Yes. Spear, I'm going to begin with the birds I've observed closely the last few days. But, Victor, you were at the marsh the last few days. Precisely. And there were birds there, birds I want to see again. Spear, drive as close to the marsh as you can, and we'll walk the rest of the way. If you don't mind my saying so, it sounds rather silly to me. Do you mind doing what I ask? No, I don't mind. Why should I? I don't know. But then there are other things I don't know. Things I intend to find out about. Do you have a gun? A what? A gun. What's the matter? Don't you understand English? Look, Victor, I can understand you're being upset about the will. Well, have you got a gun or haven't you? There's a double barrel shotgun on the back of a car. That's perfect for what I want. <laughs> I'll row out to the middle of the marsh where the accident happened. Very well, if that's what you want, but it seems rather... That's what I want. Okay. Well, here we are. Now, what's this got to do with birds? Plenty. See that buzzard of a crow sitting there on the fishing weir? The bird you crippled? Well, watch me take a shot at him. You missed him. I intended to. Killing isn't in my line. What does that crack mean? You'll know soon enough. I don't understand you, Victor. First you try to keep me from shooting that bird. Then you take a crack at him and miss him on purpose. You must be losing your mind. On the contrary, my mind is just beginning to function. Now, Spear, I want you to row over to the fish trap. Huh? You heard me. I said row over to the fishing weir. Now, look, Victor, I've had all of this I want. You can't order me around. I'll remind you that this is a double barrel shotgun. Only one shell has been fired, so the other barrel is still loaded. And it's pointed right at you. Do I make myself understood? Yes. All right, then. Row! Edge the boat over a little, Spear. Right against the stake that crow is sitting on. Why, it's back. Yes, it's back. Back on the same stake it's been sitting on for three days now. It just sits there and stares hungrily straight down into the water. Oh, what of it? That bird is a scavenger spear. It isn't here to catch fish like the other birds. It's only interested in carrion. All right, so it's interested in carrion. What's that to me? You're interested in carrion too, spear, but in a different way. You're crazy. You don't know what you're saying. Prove it. Let's investigate that stake, the one the bird was perched on. No. No, let's go back to the house. You're afraid because my uncle's corpse is at the other end of it, spear. No, of course not. It's because... Why are you giving that? No. I've got the gun. All right, your uncle's down there at the bottom of the fish trap. I killed him just as I'm going to kill you right... Oh. I got him just in time, Mr. Victor. I heard what he said. I was there in the duck blind. I'm sure glad I had my rifle with me. I told him that Corvus Caroni was the bird of death. This is the story of a man named Spear, of a bird, a kind of carrion crow, of a student of bird life named Victor, and of his uncle, Oren. A story of birds and men interwoven as the threads of life and death. Shadows and stillness. Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. 